This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 569, recorded on October 11th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Despommiers. Good afternoon, Vincent. It's pretty cloudy out. It is. But and, the temperature uh, is um, humane, at least. It's well, about it's, it's, 62, 63. I yeah, think. but it's been like 15, 16 C all week. Right. I have to wear a jacket now. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, the day I flew back from Austin, oh, well, it was last Saturday. Yeah. It was 95 in Austin. Yeah, I get off the plane here. It was 60 Fahrenheit. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Hey, it's, uh, yeah, kind of similar here. It's overcast and blustery in 61 Fahrenheit, 16 C. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. And it's just as overcast and just as yeah. cold here. It's kind of <laughs> meh. I really, exactly. uh, I really would like to move somewhere where it's warm all the time. Oh, San Diego, it's perfect. Too many people. <laughs> Austin, <laughs> you right? didn't say that. Isn't yeah, it, is, I actually, is it Austin like the center of Twiv now? <laughs> I, I, I like Austin. It's an interesting city. Um, it is. I agree. Uh, I've been told that uh, we are not moving anywhere in Texas. No, my wife doesn't like <laughs> oh, Texas. No. Okay. Uh, although see, it's for the outsider view of Texas is. Different. So Rich Condit, who was there, said, you know, all the big cities are blue. They are. <laughs> mm-hmm. The rest of the country is not. It's true. Um, the outsider view of New Jersey is also a little different. <laughs> yeah, everyone thinks we're a smelly, horrible well, state, but there's beautiful yes. parts of New Jersey. The Sopranos, et cetera. <laughs> um, I mean, we we are on a campus that is called the Forest, so... Right. Yeah, you have lots of trees yeah. and stuff oh, around. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to go far to get to nice country. Well, we drove from Austin to Galveston and back. It was a lovely um, mm-hmm. drive. Not interesting country. I mean, not very mountainous. <laughs> it's or, pretty, but they do have a central hilly area. It's called yeah. the hill country, and it's, it's beautiful up there. Anyway, I like Austin a lot. It's the downtown is pretty cool. Um, now I don't want to live in Galveston, but I, the science there was tremendous. <laughs> Um, Good. When Rich comes back to Twiv, we'll talk about our experience at the BSL four. No, yeah. well, actually, it's Galveston National Lab, which houses BSL two through four, and it was built at the same time as the Needle. I didn't know this, but mm-hmm. after the Amerithrax attacks, right? You know mm-hmm. that. You know that, Dixon. You're looking at me puzzlingly. Post nine eleven, the anthrax mailings. Okay, oh, they call it a marathrax. Well, you see, I didn't. And they, the the U.S. decided because they, they don't take Mastercard. <laughs> the, exactly. US, the U.S. Exactly. decided they needed more high containment labs. Got it. So they ran a contest. Oh, I see. And twelve sites applied, and they awarded two: one to Galveston and one to Boston. Started, this was the beginning of the mushrooming biodefense industry. Biodefense. Exactly right. <laughs> and then um, they're both started to be built at the same time, but. Galveston's was approved. In don't they have one in Hamilton also? Though? Yeah, Hamilton, Montana. Sure. Uh, yeah, you and I visited. Don't we you did. remember? We did. We did. And um, so those are the two. Those two are on uh, academic campuses, which is right. unusual. Most of them are not. Right. So like Gal- like uh, Hamilton is just on a NIH lab site, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, Galveston went live in two thousand and eight, mm-hmm. and um, you know Needle had many more, more years of. <laughs> Arguing with yeah. over a decade, right? <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. Yep. Yeah. Um, two weeks after the NIH turned the keys over to Galveston, <laughs> the, a Hurricane were, Ike uh, went through. Exactly. And they had 20 feet of water. But fortunately, the first floor of the building was designed to have nothing of importance. <laughs> Galveston has had some horrible floods. <laughs> the uh, electrical backup generators were on the next floor up. So they ran, they actually powered much of the campus, we were told. And the animals were higher up. I the hope animals were higher up, yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, he told us, so the oil tanks that fuel the generator, they have to be strapped down very tightly because they will float, <laughs> of course, in a flood. <laughs> so they worked. It all worked. Right. They have never had um, a problem with a hurricane. They built hmm. it to withstand a Category 5. Wow. And you may ask why. 
would they build the site there? <laughs> because they already had a BSL four. It's called the Shope Lab, uh, named after yeah. Bob Shope, who moved there and he died, I think, before it was open. Right. And so they named it after him. So they had experience at running one. Hmm. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk more when when Rich comes. It was very fun. Thank you, Galveston. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a little poem. It was very fun. Thank you, Galveston. Yeah. <laughs> Galveston is a resort island off the southern yes. coast of Texas, yeah. and I didn't realize that. They've got some challenging geographic problems, though. They really do, because they get a lot of high tide flooding and that sort of thing. But there is a, And huge amounts of rain sometimes. There's a, a, a line of, of big ships oh, yeah. right off the coast yeah. going up That's the, right. That's right. Uh, the uh, channel to Houston. Right. So they used mm-hmm. to stop at Galveston. That's right. And then they dredged all the way up to Houston. Now the ships go up there. Right. And you can just stand there and watch them all day long, streaming yep. by. It's yep. amazing. That's the oil coming in from the Gulf. It certainly is. Going to the refineries. Okay. Mm. We have a couple of follow-ups. Johan writes, hey. Hey. So that's hello. In, in <laughs> that's <school>. us? <laughs> hey. Hey. People <laughs> for horses. Hey, we're talking. <laughs> Nee. Um, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the last two episodes from KI, what we always call the Karoliska <laughs> Institute. Uh-huh. I don't know why. Why would you call it the Karoliska instead of the Karolinska? It's a joke. As a Swede, I often think the show is a bit too U.S. centric, so I really enjoyed these episodes. This is Johan Skikat from Min iPhone. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> I love That's it. not his title. That's, you know. <laughs> so... Um, uh, there, there are going to be a bunch more from Europe in the next few months, and I want to contrast this letter from with the one who said I travel too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Johan likes the European representation, but I'm not supposed to fly there. I guess I have to take a boat, like the yeah. the, the little the lady who went to talk to the UN. That that'll lead into the budget, right? Um, yeah. So. Uh, I wonder if we went through every paper we've ever done, if there is a U.S. centricity about the authors. What would you think? You have you have an offhand feeling? I, uh, you'd have to you'd have to correct for the U.S. centricity of the published literature. Right. Oh, so that already exists. We know this. So right? I mean, yeah. we we don't get a whole lot of representation from places that don't have a whole lot of representation in published science. Um, and we're only reading English language papers. And we're only reading English language papers, so that restricts it. And but most of the uh, science literature is in English. There's, now, there's right? probably a way to do this calculation if somebody wanted to. So Europe has very good publishing. You know, Scandinavia yes, is yeah, very good. Right. Asia, <laughs> many parts of Asia do. South America. So many countries publish. Maybe not as much as we do. So yeah, uh, yeah I thought that it would take many hours to do this with all the papers we've done. So I can't do it. But hmm. uh, if anyone wants to do it, it should be. Unfortunately, it should be as easy as running a spreadsheet, but the data aren't collated, so <laughs> right. Can't do it. I mean, you'd have there to know where some, all the authors from. Plus, yeah, there there might be some kind of um, data mining that you could do on PubMed if you took all the papers that we've done, plugged it in there. Maybe I'm not. They, they've oh, got maybe. a. There are plethora. They, they have an API for PubMed, so people can do stuff like that. But yeah. I don't know what will be involved. But every time we have multiple author papers to review, it's it's obvious to me, at least, that you get a lot of cross sections of Chinese and uh, Filipino and African, and you have a lot of multinational. Yeah, like one of our authors. papers today, yeah. is all from China and Thailand. Look at that. One yeah. one author mm-hmm. from uh, the That's US. Right. That's right. So even if it's published in the U.S., it's not U.S.-centric in terms of the authors. Now, groups. in terms of live guests, no, that was, we are, oh, yeah, right. because, oh, can't avoid it. because of the travel issue, <laughs> right? Sure, and course. it's only in the past two years that we have started to get more invites from hmm. Europe, which right. is great. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. well, you mm-hmm. just need to pay for us to come because <laughs> we don't have any money. Exactly right. But it's cheaper to, f- to go throughout the U.S. So I'm invited to Singapore in December, and I'm going to do wow. a bunch of twibs from there. But, cool. um, okay. That's uh, cool. Alan, can you take Mike's? Sure. Mike writes, Dear Twiv, I love the show, especially how you emphasize breadth and connections, but there is something slightly wrong on the Internet I'm compelled to fix. Hmm. <laughs> 
Just something. <laughs> Vincent and Alan drive me a little nuts whenever they talk about the differences between IPV and OPV for polio eradication. Both are, of course, correct that OPV, oral polio vaccine, Sabin vaccine, has been used by the eradication program because it's cheaper and easier to deliver than IPV, inactivated polio vaccine, SOC vaccine. Drops in the mouth versus a needle in the arm makes a big difference in logistics and per dose cost. And yes, there is an acute IPV supply shortage that makes replacing OPV with IPV even more difficult right now. However, these are not the only reasons the polio eradication program still uses OPV. There is a deep epidemiological reason as well. OPV is more effective than IPV against transmission in much of the world. The very short version of it is that OPV is good at preventing infection and paralysis, while IPV alone is only good at preventing paralysis, but not infection. People who've had only IPV are as susceptible as unvaccinated people to infection when exposed. Thus, in places where exposure to polio is common, a population only vaccinated with IPV will be easily infected. And people who remain unvaccinated, most often due to systemic failures and not their own willful refusal, will be unprotected. Thus, if you want to protect everyone, even when immunization programs are not reliable, you need OPV and herd immunity to achieve that. Uh, Just on the side, I think we've talked about this. Totally. Totally. I, I, I am pretty sure that we've discussed on the totally. show, I know I've discussed with Vincent, that um, that OPV gives you both mucosal and humoral immunity, meaning that your gut is immune sure. from carrying the virus and your bloodstream is immune from getting it into your uh, your nerves, and so you're protected on two levels. IPV gives you only humoral immunity, so your gut can still support replication of the virus and you can serve as a carrier. Um, so I, I think we've discuss that maybe not the last I, time we talked about this I, but I, I would be surprised if we hadn't mentioned it last time but certainly over the years and on multiple twivs and i've also blogged multiple times about how opv is yeah yeah is the vaccine of choice for stopping an outbreak for sure That's and we even talked about this israeli experience a few years ago where uh, something like six birth cohorts had received ipv and then wild polio turned out to be circulating in the country because of this problem. Exactly. Right. And and the solution to that, go back in with OPV. <laughs> That's the problem, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Mike continues um, give, basically describing what we just described. Um, IPV alone doesn't block infections, so people with IPV shall still shed, shed virus. Uh, if sanitation's good enough, you can have a country that's only using IPV um, Uh, You can have a country full of people who've only had IPV who would get easily infected if they're exposed, but they never get exposed. Someone who got infected while traveling can pump poliovirus into the sewers as much as they want, but no one gets to that material, so there's no transmission. That's why IPV can produce herd immunity in places with adequate sanitation. It blocks exposure where saliva is the primary medium of exchange. This quirk of sanitation interacting with transmission routes and immunity explains why the only places on Earth that eliminated polio with IPV alone were in Scandinavia. This probably plus winter is especially inhospitable to poliovirus. And trends in sanitation explain why countries like the U.S. couldn't eliminate with IPV alone in the 1950s but can keep polio out today. Israel, which only used IPV since 2006, has populations on the cusp. They had an outbreak in 2013 to 2014 where no one got paralyzed. Sewers in multiple cities showed circulating poliovirus for about a year and temporarily restarting OPV swiftly ended the outbreak. Um, In places where sanitation is especially poor, switching to IPV alone will leave populations with no herd immunity whatsoever. That's the most important reason why the eradication program needs to rely on OPV. OPV is still necessary until poliovirus is either eradicated or global sanitation standards reach developed world levels. A great podcast. <laughs> uh, and Mike is a principal research scientist and co-chair of epidemiology at the Institute for Disease Modeling. Do we know where that is? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's check the link. Here. I've never I heard of that. Before. I've never heard of that before. Um, yeah, we have certainly mentioned all of these things in multiple yeah. previous. We had another so, piece here. You know, you'd have to be. Yeah. It's in Bellevue, yes, Washington. Yes, fantastic. Bellevue, Washington. <laughs> Bellevue, Washington. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, P.S. Believe it or not, this is the short version of the email. I tried to write a slightly longer version, but it was turning into the discussion of a paper my colleagues and I published last year. So encourage those interested to just read that and provides a link. And that's in PLOS. Uh, Forgive the shameless self-promotion. Well, we always forgive shameless (laughs) self-promotion. And then um, 
points out that the, the first sentence of the third paragraph should read, however, these are not the only reasons for polio eradication program still uses OPV. And I corrected it actually in the text so that we would read it correctly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so this, uh, this eradication of polio in Scandinavia, um, they pointed that out to me when I visited. In Sweden, for example, they only used uh, IPV, Denmark as well. Right. And, of course, you can get over 95% immunization rates, and I think that's a big part of it because there are few people left who are susceptible paralysis. If you look at the Philippines outbreak, which we talked about last time, the coverage went from 95 to 66, and boom, right. Right. you have an outbreak. Yeah. So it really needs to get below 90 so above 90, 95, that's the herd immunity number where people are protected, even if not everyone is immunized. But can't get that kind of coverage here in the U.S. Is that still a problem in the Philippines with regards to the vaccination in general? I haven't heard any more. Neither have I. But they went back and did massive OPV <laughs> immunization. Oh, yeah. right. And uh, so that's a problem, of course, because you keep introducing OPV, which circulates and will cause outbreaks when you stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So – and. I mean, this this the mucosal immunity issue is certainly a critical issue in this. But in terms of the WHO campaign to eradicate polio, the logistical issues, I think, loom larger. They do. And we have now people making alternative. Somebody's cell phone is vibrating on the table. OK, stop. Um, <laughs> people are making alternative OPVs. With the idea that you could that are non revertible, right? With the idea that you might be able to switch soon to those, and that might be a solution. Um, because, as uh, Mike says, if we switch globally to IPV, some populations <laughs> virus might keep circulating, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're going to talk about some of those new IPVs. I'm waiting for one paper on the clinical trial has been published. And I'm waiting for the the um, paper describing the construction of those strains, which is really interesting. And uh, when those are when that's out, we will do them both as a snippet and a paper on one episode. Okie dokie. Thank you. We do appreciate your comments, though. Yes. So uh, yes. it's Thank good. You, we, but this, my uh, no Alan and I have uh, <laughs> talked about this for years. You know, Alan and I said years ago that you have to stop. OPV at some point, you'll never eradicate polio. And now people are realizing this. Yes. And they argued with us at the time. Yep. No, we can do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that was good. So we have two papers that uh, kind of different. And, um, and and I thought in particular Dixon would, would like <laughs> both of them. Yeah, right? yeah. I do. I do. I both like of them have a little bit something. So it's a good thing you're here. First one is an eLife open access, so you can check right. it out. Endangered wild salmon infected by newly discovered viruses. Uh, the first author is Mordecai, and the last author is Curtis Suttle, right. well known ocean virologist over at the University of British Columbia. Mm. And, First uh, author is Gideon Mordecai, which is a thoroughly <laughs> biblical name. <laughs> it's a great name. Absolutely. Yeah, I like Must that. Must be a Mormon. Um, he, Curtis was on TWIV a while ago hmm. in, when we recorded in Montreal, Canada. Nice. Is that how you say it? Montreal or Montreal? Montreal, I guess, is well, correct. Well, it depends I think Montreal. on whether you're French-speaking Canadian or English-speaking it Canadian. Is, um, <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> you know, I, when I, I had interviewed Petter Broden at the Karolinska. He said, just call me Peter. He says, all you Americans do anyway. I said, no. <laughs> I said Petter. <laughs> so this is from the University of British Vancouver, uh, Fisheries and University Oceans of Canada. British, British Columbia. What did I say? University of British, British Vancouver. Vancouver. Right. <laughs> I'm speaking too quickly. Yes. Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the Pacific Salmon Foundation. That sounds like an interesting place to have know. lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Simon yeah. Simon Fraser University and St. George's University. Mm-hmm. Now, apparently, Pacific salmon uh, are um, really important, right, for oh, food yeah. sources Very and also important. part of the ecology, right? <clears throat> uh, but they're undergoing decline, yes. both Chinook and sockeye salmon. Or Chinook. Chinook. Yes. Uh, and if you Google Chinook, you'll get the helicopter first. You will. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Dixon and I were trying to figure out the origin. Yeah. And the best we could do is it's a name for a wind of some kind. That, yeah, it's a Native American term for wind. 
Uh, and so- sockeye and Chinook salmon are two different species of the same genus. They are. And okay. they're, these are wild salmon? Yep. But, and, and, and they're Pacific salmon. Pacific, Pacific and, salmon. And they can also be farmed, is that correct? Yes, but uh, there are five altogether. There's a pink salmon, a dog salmon, a Chinook salmon, a coho salmon, and they have, they go by other names as well. Um, the, the Chinook salmon is also called king salmon because it's the biggest of the five species okay. that – but there's another salmon that also uh, migrates into uh, some Japanese islands. Mm-hmm. It's a sixth species of Pacific salmon, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay, so these are anadromous <clears throat> species. They're anadromous. They anadromous, grow. which means, Dixon? They uh, spawn in fresh water and grow up in salt water. And then, yeah, come back to spawn. And when they do, they so die. They go back and forth. They die. These salmon all die after they spawn. But the Atlantic salmon, uh, Salmo solar, uh, which is present all the way up through the American Northwest, Northeast rather, and then over into um, Europe. That salmon can spawn multiple times before it dies. So it's but it's it's endangered because of all the dams oh, we put in the eastern. Rivers. No question about it. No question about <laughs> so it. So apparently, Chinook, Chinook. How do you say it? Chinook. Chinook are at a small percentage of their historic levels. Oh, More than fifty sure. stocks are extinct. <clears throat> yes, and and you can tell this by the fact that. When this salmon spawns, where Zinson and I are sitting at a big round table, the reds that they make, the, the nests in the bottom of the river, they're about the size of this table. Mm-hmm. So you can take a helicopter and fly down a river and find out how many Chinook there so are. So red is the name for the nest? Yeah. Or R-E-D-D? D-D. Yes, that's correct. Then you wrote a book called The Red. I did. Is that why you called it The Red? It was based on a salmon nest? Yes. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> so there's some... There's some um, idea that infectious diseases may be part of this uh, decline because and uh, many infectious well, agents are in these it's pigs. mostly habitat loss that's basically what you think so yeah i know so it's, it, it's, well it's habitat loss and resource exploitation <laughs> we fish the heck out of these yeah, species because this yeah. this is what you put in your bagel correct and the other thing is that <laughs> this this is an odd situation because this article came out simultaneously with the release of the information this year that this is the best year for chinook salmon in 20 years yeah. and no one has an explanation for it they just multiple so you, this is what you'd put along with a schmear is that right Dixon? you yes. would <laughs> you absolutely would <laughs> uh, this week's twip was called uh, blood schmear but but <laughs> mostly it's atlantic salmon for the for the smoked salmon not for the oh, pacific right, yeah. salmon yeah, it's, it's mostly atlantic salmon all right but the but atlantic or wild uh, salmon also they're not farmed no they're farmed as well Both they're farmed. Farmed. Yeah, farmed so how do you farm salmon you make a big pen in the ocean and you yeah. let them grow but what about the freshwater part well you don't need the freshwater part if you start from eggs put the eggs in the hatchery right and then at a certain size you throw them in a pen in the ocean that's correct I can imagine going from fresh to salt water is a bit of a shock. Very much so. But the thing is that there's these pens are over sort of stagnant bodies of uh, ocean water. Mm-hmm. And the waste products build up on the floor of the ocean. And they foster the uh, elicitation of parasitic diseases of ah. all kinds. So they don't diffuse away? <coughs> currents don't. don't take them? In, in some places they do. So if they raise them in the uh, San Juan Islands, mm-hmm. for instance, out in the Pacific coast, uh, there's a huge current that sweeps those uh, places clean. But in Norway, they raise the salmon inside the fjords, and no, the both, movement yeah. almost doesn't work at yeah, all. Yeah, so right. they get a lot of salmon diseases out there. I have flown over um, the UK <coughs> and offshore. You can see the pens and the yeah. salmon jumping. Absolutely. It's so, so spectacular. <laughs> it yes, truly Bri- is. Brianne, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say you could also imagine – uh, a fair amount of infectious disease within the farms yes. um, in the hatcheries. That's correct. Yes. That is absolutely correct. So right. these, these fish are much more crowded in these settings than oh, they yeah. would be in nature. Yes, they are. It's crazy. And the other thing is that the, the big worry is that the, um, the domesticated salmon, which have far lower resistances to various environmental influences like cold temperatures or uh, pollutants of various sorts will interbreed with the wild salmon that already are resistant to all these things and they'll knock out the wild strains. Hmm. And they've, they've got some big problems up in the Northeast uh, in Canada for this. They're very worried about it. So Ian Anderson, yep. do you know who that is, Dixon? I should, but I don't. No, he used to be in 
Jethro Tull. He was the guy oh. playing the flute. Oh, <laughs> he like was a, one leg. He used he, to play. It no, he didn't have one. He had two legs. But nobody he used to stand on. Yeah, he used to put one up. It was his signature. But he owns uh, many salmon farms. Oh, is that true? Yeah, that was his thing after making Got a lot of money <laughs> singing. It. One way to avoid all of this would have been to raise Pacific salmon in the Atlantic Ocean and Atlantic salmon in the Pacific Ocean, and then you wouldn't have to worry about wild strains contaminating each other. Well, except that then you'd be <laughs> introducing a new species into each place. But they do right? anyway. They do anyway. They, they, they do anyway. Okay. They do anyway. So, But if they were to restrict everything to Atlantic salmon in the Pacific Ocean and mm. Pacific salmon in the Atlantic Ocean, they wouldn't They wouldn't. Do you ever go worry. fishing for salmon? I did once, yeah. I went up to the Restigouche River mm-hmm. and uh, caught two what they call grills, which are two-year-old and three-year-old salmon. They're about 10 to 12 pounds. They're pretty good-sized fish, but everybody was expecting a 20 to 30-pound fish. Mm. And did you grill them? I did not. No, 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 I didn't grill them. Did you put them back? <laughs> yeah, we threw all our fish Good. back. But but they allow you to keep the grills because they don't consider them as an uh, important uh, component of the spawning runs. When I was so the, the grills are, <coughs> what age are they? They've been one to, to sea one and to two years. The one they're to one to two years. years. Okay, and then they then they become smolts. Uh, smolts are the ones that are which are the ones to, that are going out to sea. That's, that's the yeah, because in the paper I came across smoltification and <laughs> wait, what is? So they start as alvins when they hatch. Alvins, alvins, yeah. and then they Their voice hit, is very then high. They go to par, <laughs> and then once they hit the ocean, they're smolts. Oh, right. Okay. And then after that, they're just juvenile salmon. So these salmon, by the way, if you go to San Francisco for a trip, let's say you went there for a meeting or something like this, they have boats that leave the dock in the harbor of San Francisco mm-hmm. that will take you out and troll for these salmon, and you can catch them right there. Mm-hmm. They're all over the place. I don't, I don't want to do that, but I'm happy to talk about a, <laughs> do you, do you a remember paper the, on do salmon you, viruses. <laughs> do you remember the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? I do, yes. There was a scene in there where he took the whole troop of <laughs> inmates really? on a salmon fishing venture, and they remember. all came back with salmon. I don't remember. Oh, it was fun. Uh, so in this paper, they ask, are viruses associated with this decline? Do, are salmon getting sick? So they sample right. a lot of fish, right. thousands and thousands of fish, dead both fish. dead and That's right. healthy. And they do some sequence analysis That's and right. some pathology. And they start by using, by looking at the RNA in the fish and seeing if, if they use what they call a viral disease detection biomarker panel, right. okay, which means transcripts or mrnas are produced that are part look are part of an immune response right certain signature genes are being induced which would be consistent with infection so 31 percent of moribund <laughs> salmon which means they, they're sick they're sick, dying they're dying yeah. they are and these are the atlantic salmon atlantic salmon uh, we're in this disease state and half of them didn't have any known rna viruses in them and then they took these individuals that were positive for these panels, this panel, but negative for known salmon viruses. So that includes piscine, orthorheovirus, erythrocytic necrosis virus, and so on. And then they um, sequenced uh, the whole transcriptome of those fish samples, and they get transcripts from uh, three families, arenaviruses, nidoviruses, and rheoviruses. Three are families of RNA viruses, which contain, of course, pathogens of various species. And they can assemble complete genomes from representatives of each of these. And they, at one point, they looked at over 6,000 wild juvenile Chinook and sockeyes. Right. And... I don't know where they got 6,000. Man, that's a big sampling. But they met. The fishing the, boats, I meant. Easy to catch. 6,000. How many days yeah. would that take? Probably an afternoon. You're serious. But they did it wow. all, all around uh, Vancouver Island. So they yeah, no, went around the whole island, I guess at ports. When they're running, they are running. Because then they can yeah, map. I, my assumption here, I didn't dig into the methods, but my assumption was that they went to fishing boats. Yeah, they don't tell you, actually. They don't tell I mean, during the heights of the runs, you can find a whole bunch of dead fish along the banks on both sides of the mm. river. So you can sample. Right. Now, these, these wild ones they sampled were live. Yeah. So right. Those, right. Must have been just live recently the netted. Anyway. Yeah, so they're not, these are not more abundant or dead. <coughs> no. Yeah, no, these 6,000 were okay. They just wanted to know, are these uh, viruses, are these viruses in, them? in the wild population? And they put it on a map of Vancouver Island, which is cool. So you can right. see where each of these uh, viruses are present. Um, and they're different. They're in different places. They have different epidemiologies, sure, and, so forth, and dynamics, sure. right? 
So, for example, the arena viruses, they're pretty common and widespread in both Chinook and sockeyes. Nidoviruses were pretty localized um, and mostly in Chinooks leaving freshwater hatcheries. <laughs> why, why do you laugh? Well, that's that's where they, if you cram everything together yeah. and you don't have any natural disease control mechanisms like uh, uh, shredders and the other kinds of insect life in the river itself, then that's what that, you're going to get. Infected. That's okay. what you're going to yeah. get. And that real virus, they only found in farmed Chinooks. How about that? Right. It's pretty cool. So the arena discovery is cool. If listeners of TWIV, faithful listeners of TWIV, <laughs> uh, will remember <laughs> that we talked about a arena virus of snakes about ah. uh, seven years ago. Mark Stengline who uh, did that work with Joe DeRisi. And um, so that's the only other example of a non-mammalian um, hmm. arena virus. So they're very uh, distantly related, probably a new part of a new genus. And then they say, okay, these, you know, these fish have these viruses. Do, do they have pathology in their tissues? And hmm. so they make slices and stain them and they can see. For example, with this arena virus in the farmed uh, Chinooks, um, they have inflammation of the spleen and liver, and, you know, necrosis in the kidney, fluid, um, and hemorrhaging, anemia, et cetera. Right, right. So each of these species uh, that were positive, they have lesions of various sorts. In the farmed salmon. In the farm, the yeah. Chinooks, yeah. So the farm, farm Chinook salmon that were positive for this arena virus, SPAV1, they've called it. SPAV1, yeah. Had, they, had pathology. Wild Chinooks and sockeye that were positive for this. Few lesions, yeah. But yeah, didn't, they, oh, they seem that, to be fine. That, so is, this, that is the point. So why, what is that? Well, because their diet probably um, supplies all of the nutrients that these fish need to fight off a variety of Maybe. diseases, whereas the ones that are raised in the hatch. Well, remember now, this is so far an association, so right. understood. other experiments would need to be done to prove that the virus is causing the pathology. This is and you may be, the, the other thing that occurred to me as I was reading this is when they're sampling the wild salmon, these are wild-caught um, salmon that are sick, that have these spleen and liver lesions and such. You're probably not going to catch them. No. Mm -hmm. No, the if, seals and if the If they're orcas sick will in the wild, they already got eaten. That's so the right. wild yeah. the wild Chinook that you're sampling are by definition healthier fish. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um they see some some uh hep hepatitis. They see more lesions in dead ch Chinook than in uh live ones. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is good. And they have some evidence that viruses in red blood cells. So they say this is the first evidence for arena virus infection in fish. Hmm. And they say it could be the an agent of disease, but you would have to do some infection studies to prove that, right? Right. So that Because uh, you don't know what else is going here. No. Cult Next. Cultured Chinook also uh, turned up the nidovirus and a rheovirus. They call it the Chinook aqua rheovirus, known to cause hemorrhagic diseases, other of these aqua rheoviruses, and mm -hmm. have led to losses in aquaculture in China. Right. These fish have anemia, dark spleen, and blood-filled kidneys. <laughs> hemorrhagic manifestation. Right. It's lovely. And the Nido virus, so Nido is the larger, it's an order containing coronaviridae and other viruses that have uh, well, this nested RNA structure. Uh, this is the Pacific Salmon Nidovirus. Now back to the arenas, relatively widespread along the coast of southwestern British Columbia and ocean-caught Chinook and sockeyes. Hmm. And um, they think the virus is transmitted to juvenile salmon throughout southern BC soon after they enter the ocean, which they say is a critical period for their survival. I guess they could be picked off readily, right? The predators could be sitting there waiting for them to come out of the mouths of the sure. river. Hey, it's breakfast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want a, an example of that, if you don't mind, on a side, is up in the, um, the northwest portions of Canada. Because of global climate change, the striped bass populations have been moving further north. Mm -hmm. And now they do exactly that. They sit at the mouths of these rivers yeah. that all the, uh, the smolt come out of, yeah. and they decimate, decimate, 
that's they don't eliminate, yes. but they decimate the uh, Atlantic salmon 10%, population. They, they kill, or kill 10% of them. Perhaps even more than that. So so I heard a lamentation from somebody who goes up there to salmon fish, and he says, we ought to get rid of those striped bass. They're taking all our salmon. I said, why don't you just go fish for the striped bass? Yeah. They're a lot of fun to catch. They're delicious. And they're delicious. They taste just yeah. like salmon now. <laughs> <laughs> So that, but but that's an example of if you don't think climate change is real, just go up to that situation and check it out. That, that didn't, never used to be the case. They mm-hmm. couldn't stand the cold water, and now they're up there. So that's that's what's happening. So a few other tidbits here: um, the distribution of this aqua rio virus was, is, was different from the arena virus. Mm-hmm. The rio was not detected in any juvenile wild or hatchery chinooks despite being detected in farmed fish right. on both the West and East Coast. Over 20% of moribund Chinook aquaculture fish were positive for C, for this uh, So that's, that's an interesting distinction that you just made between hatchery-derived mm-hmm. fish and, right. and, and farmed fish. So the, the hatchery fish will end up in farms, but a lot of the hatchery fish will just be released into the ocean. Oh, they do that on purpose. So a lot of Native American tribes uh-huh. that are along that coastline uh, seed the rivers with their own strains of salmon, and then they have permission to harvest them at the when they return. Yeah, interesting. So there's a whole ecology that goes on there. Um, they so they say we should be looking at these viruses in fish populations more carefully. Absolutely. The um, yeah. Nido virus was associated with a handful of salmon enhancement hatcheries. That's what you're just talking about. Yes. You hatch fish and yes. you throw them in the ocean, that's right? right. That's but right. also in 18%... They're of not enhanced salmon. You're just enhancing no. the population. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> exactly. Enhancing salmon numbers. That, that's right. Yes. Also in 18% of aquaculture, Chinook, and 3% of wild Chinook. Primarily in the gill tissue, they find um, mm. this virus. Mm. And of course... Other coronaviruses like MERS and SARS infect our gill tissue, which are known as lungs, right? Right. <laughs> so we don't have gill tissue. I know, I know. Don't write in. It's okay. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. All right. So that's basically the finding. This is a perfect snippet because they can find these viruses in both healthy yeah. and sick fish. That's right. And there, there are three different ones they've found. There are probably more. And someone needs to do some experiments to see if these viruses actually cause the disease. But meanwhile, you should probably be looking for them more in fish populations. And, of course, this all brings up the question, what do we do about them? Right. Right. (laughs) We're not going to give fish antivirals or vaccines. Actually, some farm fish are vaccinated, right? Yes, yes. I don't know if you could do it with a salmon because you'd have to catch them, right? There's a a, a pancreatic infectious anemia that's... uh, a, a, a staple for worry with regards to farmed uh, mm-hmm. salmonids, trout, and salmons as well. That it has a very high mortality rate, and they're deathly afraid of it. So there are many viral vaccines for fish. Yep, there are lots of review articles if Absolutely. you uh, search for them. Yep, viral vaccines for farmed fish. And so, if I remember, we talked about this a long time ago. They take the the young fish after hatching. What are they called? Well, it depends on smolt. <laughs> no, smolts are, are Alvins. What's a smolt? A smolt, smolt is, is about to go to salt water. Just about okay. to hit. The par a is the intermediate old. size. The alvin is the immediately hatched fish. <laughs> Still has the egg sac on it. <laughs> All right. I just know that you can pick these out of you can. It's the tank easy. and quickly uh, put a needle in and immunize them. So sure, sure. that's a reasonable thing. But you, you have to make sure that the viruses that we talked about here are the ones causing disease before you make a vaccine, right? So you need to do some research. You do. <laughs> well, and, and you might want to know sort of what types of organisms uh, these, these viruses infect. So is it just Pacific salmon or are right. some of the other life in the area? Can it also be Atlantic salmon? Exactly. Things like that. Now, another question is, when you eat this salmon and it has <laughs> these viruses in them, what happens right. to those? And I suspect they just don't infect us. They have a different tropism and right. they just pass through. Right. But if you look at metagenomic studies of fecal viromes, you're likely to pick up some of these sequences from because you're eating the salmon. Right? There you go. But mm-hmm. I, I don't think they pose any threat uh, mm-hmm. to us, although – Somewhere, someone is probably taking these viruses and throwing them onto human cells and culture just to see. Interesting. 
Sure. It's, Perhaps, it's, yes. It's easy enough to do. By the way, Vincent, this is totally off the subject, but related to what you were just saying with regards to taking something from, let's say, a fecal pellet or something. I watched the show last night about something called Cross River Gorillas. It's a subspecies of lowland gorilla, mm. and they live in the Cameroons, and they didn't know how many there were. So what do you think they did? They 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 were very difficult to see. Yes, they're yeah. secretive. So these explorers sampled all the fecal droppings yeah. in the nest sequence hmm. mitochondrial DNA. And you know what they found? They they found a maximum of twenty five gorillas in this particular area based wow. on the differences in the genetics. Yeah. Wow. it's incredible. Without ever seeing a gorilla. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand they're very, very hard cool. To- that's, I love yeah. it. I just, you can't even tell when they die because they're quickly yeah, that's uh, right. eaten. That's right. And they're gone. That's right. So that paper was mostly out of Canada. Right. 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 Yep. And now we have a paper which is mostly out of China. Exactly. And this is a Nature Microbiology article. Host serum iron modulates dengue virus acquisition by mosquitoes. Right. First author, Yi Bin Zhu. Last author, Gong Cheng from Tsinghua University, Shenzhen Center for Disease Control and Prevention, King Mongkut's Institute of Technology, that's in Bangkok, uh, the State Key Lab of Infectious Disease Prevention and Control, and it's also in China, the 920 Hospital, which is in Kunming. I love the name, 920 Hospital. Well, it's and, a it's an army hospital. Is that right? Uh-huh. They yeah, give, P- they, PLA, People's Liberation Army in Kunming, China. Joint Logistics Support Force. That's so they where that, give them numbers, yeah? I assume so, yeah. And the University of Connecticut Health Center. In right down the Farm- road from me. Farmington, Connecticut. Right. Now, dengue virus spread among humans via mosquitoes. And as you will hear in the TWIV from Galveston, probably at the end of the year, mm. there's also a sylvatic cycle in certain countries spread amongst monkeys by different mosquitoes. The Hemagogus monkeys. Hemagogus? Very pretty mosquitoes, if if you can consider. I think we saw some hemagogus at Galveston. They're very pretty. They're gorgeous. And the way they hover as they fly, yeah. it's just, just – yeah. so if they're sit, here's the cool part. So <laughs> we went to the insectary where they breed these mosquitoes for infection experiments, and – they they take the eggs and they put them in water and they add a little fish meal and it lowers the oxygen tension so they hatch and then they mature and then they you know how they get them out of this plexiglass box they vacuum them out <laughs> right. they transport them elsewhere sure. anyway so these mosquitoes they're flying and the wings you can't see them because they're moving so quickly right exactly they they light on the wall of the of the box it's plexiglass and then the all of a sudden they're buzzing still and then the, the wings stop and you can see them. Right. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And then if you just tap, they will start to buzz again. Vincent, ah, you, so could have, cool. you could have been a contender. <laughs> what are you talking about? I was just looking at mosquitoes. Some of them are very big. Some of them are tiny. Really big ranges in size. Did they, they have any tuxerine cartini? Did they? No, he said they have a lot. Those are mosquito things. larvae that eat smaller mosquito larvae. I don't know. But they have many different kinds from all over the world. And they store them as eggs. Yes. And uh, they put them in paper towels moistened inside of a Ziploc, and they put them in the fridge. You said they can stay a year. Yeah, mostly that's that true for the 80s species, but it's not true for the, the other ones. Not, so not this was the, a room about the size of, of my office, a little right. bigger. Racks with with little one-foot cubic plexiglass boxes that had the mosquitoes in them. And yeah. the whole room was white, so you can see if one gets out. Did you see them feeding them? Um no, they they give them a apple slices, right? No, they gave them a sucrose oh. juice with some cotton things that they can sit on, and the mosquitoes were sitting on it drinking. Yeah. Um, and he said, I t- said this on Twip the other day. If one gets, they have to account for every mosquito. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. CDC requirement, and if one gets out, they have to find it. So once he said one got out, and we spent fifteen hours looking for it. We did it in oh. shifts. Oh. And do you know where they found it? Behind the CO2 tank. Bingo. Oh. Isn't that funny? (laughs) Maybe it was leaking a little bit, you know. Maybe. It was fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. I'm amazed they don't have traps set for them. Well, they have all the vents are, of course, sealed off with very fine screens so they get through. The door, when you come in, you slide this very fine screen over it so they can't get out. Now, here in the insectary, they're not infected. To infect them, you bring them to the BSL 
whatever, four, three or four, depending on your virus, yeah. and you would infect them there. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to this. So dengue, humans cycle, the urban cycle is transmitted by mosquitoes who take blood meals and acquire the virus when they take a blood meal. And so um, it's well known that factors in blood can regulate infection of mosquitoes. So the mosquito, when it takes this blood meal, the virus then infects the gut cells, it spreads within the mosquito, gets back to the salivary glands, and that's how it's delivered to the next victim. So can blood influence multiplication in the mosquito and transmission? The answer is we know this is the case. And uh, plasmodium, it's a, not a virus, of course, but can be influenced, right? Blood, in fact, many factors in blood have roles in the production of gametocytes, right, Dixon? This is all true. It's true. You it, believe it. Okay. It is. Um, other compounds in, in blood have been shown to uh, influence um, transmission. So they said here, Let's take a look at blood. This is a very cool. I really like this paper. <laughs> this is this is just a this really, is really elegant cool. experiment that I was looking at it thinking, why had nobody done this? Exactly. Exactly. Because exactly. right. mm-hmm. I guess exactly. nobody thought of it and gotten around to it and they Right. Yeah. So and, it's yeah. it's beautiful and it leads to some actionable findings, right? Yeah, at least so they important took, they took information. These, yeah. I mean they, they so they took these sixty blood samples that I guess they got from a blood bank or something. Probably. Well, they might have just collected them for this study. but uh, Right. And then they grow up dengue 2 in cells, and they take that virus and mix it with blood and feed it to mosquitoes. And if you want to know how you feed uh, mosquitoes blood, I learned at the Galveston. <laughs> so the mosquitoes are in ice cream cartons, those white things with the top, and the top is mesh covered, right? So they have this this electrical device, which has six wires coming out of it, and each is connected to a cup. And in that, you put the container with blood. It gets covered with a membrane. And then you turn it upside down on the ice cream container. And it keeps the blood at 37 degrees so the mosquitoes will drink it. And, of course, you could mix the blood with virus. No, no, no. That's, that's not why it's at 37. It, it attracts the mosquito to it. Yeah, well. It's They're thermal tactic. Yes, but so if, if, if it were meant, they, wouldn't, wouldn't go they would never go there. Didn't I say that? No. What did I say? So the mosquitoes would drink it? <laughs> yeah, but they're yeah. they're attracted first to right, it so and then they're attracted they to it, right. That's right. It's the temperature that attracts them. Exactly. So uh, that's how you feed them. and you can, and That's how they feed on us, too. <laughs> well, you could put your arm in there if you'd like. Yeah, I knew someone who did that all the time. You can't put No, virus. thank you. <laughs> you can't put viruses. I became allergic to their, um, to their secretions after a while. Well, so in you, fact, before this membrane technique was developed, that was the way you fed laboratory mosquitoes. You'd stick right. an arm in the in the cage. Yes. Um, but of course you couldn't give them viruses. You couldn't give them any yeah. other blood besides your own. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So here they mix these 60 blood samples with dengue and feed it to mosquitoes. And then they ask, uh, what's the infection ratio of the mosquito? In the mosquito. And it varies between zero and 62%. Right. Depending on the blood. Depending right. on the I, I mean, blood. I guess we shouldn't be surprised, right? Some <laughs> some blood is better than others at carrying dengue into the mosquitoes. Correct. Correct. So mm-hmm. then you say, what what is it in the blood? And then you can measure different, they say 12 basic blood constituents. Right. And it turns out to be iron. <laughs> yeah, so they looked at iron, sodium, zinc, all this stuff. This must have been an amazing day in the lab when they processed these data. Absolutely. Yeah. Like what's yeah. the, what's the concentration of potassium in the blood versus the mosquito infection <laughs> rate? Eh, varies all over the place. Eh, right. Sodium varies all over the place. Right. Iron, bang, hey, beautiful linear regression curve, P less than <laughs> 0.001. It's sure. just, wow. So is there a typical difference in iron concentrations in blood between men and women? Because women obviously have a yeah, menstrual cycle. Question. Sure. Certainly, I, I believe at, so, yeah. at certain times of the month, you would. Right. Find you know, maybe that's why I rarely get bitten because I, I have <laughs> or a lot get of dengue. Iron. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can. I sit next to my wife outdoors on the summer evening. She's bitten constantly. Goes inside and leaves me out there, and I'm not bitten. I don't so have this any problem. this paper also has a wonderful lead in to what you might do to prevent the transmission uh-huh. of dengue. Yes, we'll mm-hmm. talk about that. But I love it. I there love are some it. potential issues. As we'll see. Yes, uh, but of course. So now you can take these bloods and you can add um, compounds that chelate the iron, like right. deferoxamine. It binds iron, right? Mm-hmm. Or and, you can add iron. Or you can add iron. So when you, when you bind up the iron, the infection of the mosquitoes goes up. 
And when you add iron, infection goes down. So, so far, low iron, better infection. Right. Right. I, iron appears right. to be inhibiting infection of the mosquitoes. Exactly. And then they look at mm-hmm. why. Um, and, you know, in, um, in the blood, iron isn't floating around by itself. It's no. usually bound to transferrin. Correct. A protein that is bound to the transferrin receptor on cell surfaces, and that's what pulls it into cells because that's where iron, one of the places iron needs to go. That's right, right. Inside of cells. Mm-hmm. That's right. And they actually give uh, mosquitoes iron-loaded transferrin. That's true. But then there's another protein in the gut tract, which also binds divalent cations, which <laughs> allows them to reabsorb iron that's lost during the metabolic mm-hmm. breakdown of hemoglobin. Uh, it turns out that the iron in the red blood cells is not a factor here. No. They, they do actually look at that. Um most of the iron in red blood cells, right, bound to heme, but they find no correlation between heme iron and dengue uh, prevalence. So it's the ferritin iron that seems to be doing it, not the uh, heme. And they do a bunch so of no, experiments. So the serum, serum iron. Serum right. iron. The, sort of the free iron. So we go serum iron and heme iron, which is not an issue. No. But um, as you know, Dixon, the mosquitoes don't like this heme iron either, right? No, they don't. <laughs> they want to get well, rid no, of it. Well, no, no, not the mosquitoes. The malaria parasites don't like the heme. Oh, the malaria. That's right. So they make They make a stacking. They it. stack. The, the what is that called? It's a stacking enzyme. Chlor- oh. Chloroquine interferes with that process. What's the, but is there a name for that crystal of iron? Hemozoan. Hemozoan, yes. Yeah. So the ma- malaria parasite does not want that. No. Okay. Not the mosquito. It's toxic for the parasite. All right. So then they do some experiments in mice because they can't do these in humans. Right. So they have a mouse model, which is an immunocompromised mouse because that's what you need for dengue to replicate (laughs) in. I was going to ask about that. Because if you put dengue into wild type mice, it just gets cleared and they can't get the viremia they need for transmission. So they use mice lacking interferon receptors, IFNAR, null mice. So you infect these mice with dengue. And you let the virus reproduce, and then you put mosquitoes on the mice. And the mice can't smack them away, so they get bitten. And and you can give them iron supplements Mm. and see the effect on the acquisition of infection uh, by the mosquito. Exactly. All right. So if you, um, they can show that. If you give mice the iron supplement, it actually increases iron in the blood. That's an important control to look at, right? Mm-hmm. And when you have higher viral uh, iron load in the mice, you decrease um, the load in the mosquito, the amount of virus in the mosquito. Yeah. Uh, and then you can, um, importantly, when you do this, you don't affect the dengue viremia in the mice. Something's happening in the mosquito. Right, so giving mice more iron doesn't affect how much dengue virus they have. Right. Yes. Right. That's very important. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because it's a mosquito characteristic. It's a it's a thing going on in mosquitoes, which we'll we'll find out shortly. But that's pretty cool. Very. Um. Let's see here. Sometimes I have so many lines highlighted. <laughs> <laughs> so, iron doesn't affect viremia, but influences acquisition. Of the virus by mosquitoes. That's what we learned so far in mice. Right. Right. Now, so then, um, how does it work? How does it work is is the interesting question. And there are there are, you know, iron is bound to transferrin uh, in the blood, and in mosquitoes, it uh, is imported. There are importers in mosquito cells mm-hmm. um, of, of these free irons. Um. And ferritin is involved in mosquitoes as well. They can silence the mosquito ferritin gene. <laughs> so that reduces dengue replication because I, I guess when you f- silence the ferritin gene, the iron free iron goes up. Does that make sense? That's the way it I interpreted it. Yeah, sure. I think so. And, yes. and if you produce more ferritin in mosquitoes, uh, you increase viral burden, I guess, because you're binding up right. the iron. Um. And they have mosquitoes have four transferrin genes. When they knock them all out, you get more replication of dengue. Again, probably because you got more free iron floating around. That which is weird to me because the human blood, the ferritin is bound to iron, but 
it still has an effect in mosquitoes. So mosquitoes must be able to separate the, the right. ferritin from the iron. During the digestion. I guess so. When Correct. They, when they're digesting it, yeah. Absolutely. Um, let's see. All right. So now this is a cool experiment. What is actually the mechanism? So it's involved... It's involving ferritin in some way. Well, what is the iron doing? So they do an RNA sequencing experiment of mosquitoes that have been fed human blood uh, with or without an iron supplement. They actually take the midgut of the mosquito out, which is where the blood is going, right? They extract RNA and they sequence all the messenger RNAs with and without iron supplement. <laughs> okay. And the the cool thing here is that they find a very down much down regulation of two genes a hydrogen peroxidase and a superoxide dismutase uh-huh. they are down regulation up to down regulated up to 13,000 fold in the presence of iron wow these two enzymes the the gene the enzymes encoded in those two genes are modulators of reactive oxygen species right and they reduce reactive oxygen species. Yeah, yeah. Right. So reactive oxygen species are needed to restrict dengue replication. That's known. So basically the iron is down-regulating these two genes. Reactive oxygen species are, are down, and dengue virus is limited. So in, in low iron, the virus replicates well because there's no uh, ROS to... Interfere with it. Interfere with it. Exactly. High iron, you induce these genes that... High oxygen and superoxide dismutase knocks out the virus. So these two genes, I'm confusing myself, are down-regulated by iron. Right. They're needed to modulate reactive oxygen species, which would inhibit dengue. Decrease reactive oxygen. Yeah, so the genes... Yeah. The the gene products decrease reactive oxygen. Yeah. Iron decreases expression of these genes. So in the presence of iron, you end up with more, more reactive, reactive oxygen, oxygen. Which inhibits which inactivates dengue. the virus and, yeah. and in yeah. Bingo. And they do a series of knockouts. So it's, a, and, it's a double negative. And supplementations yeah. to show this that this is actually what's happening. They can knock down these uh, peroxidases and superoxide dismutases and show that that increases ROS activation. If you supplement um, mosquitoes with iron, you can increase this reactive oxygen activity in the guts of mosquitoes. So it all and makes it sense. Of, yeah, And it sort of makes sense because we know that you know, oxygen reacts with iron. And so if you have more iron, you're going to have increases in making reactive oxygen species. Right. Just so we sure. can thank Tony James a little bit for all this research. A friend of mine out in San Diego. We had him on Twitter. We did, yeah. uh, because he really invented uh, how to uh, transfect mosquitoes. Really? Yep. He was the one that had the breakthrough. So the conclusion here, serum iron hinders replication by inducing ROS activity in the epithelium of mosquito guts. Right. By down-regulating this peroxidase and superoxide dismutase. Okay. Now. So at this point in the paper. I'm saying, okay, we need to give everybody exactly. iron supplementation exactly. in the tropics, and right. we'll take oh, care of it. Oh, yeah, but guess right. what? Or, guess or we need to treat up. everyone's oh. anemia. No, well, you should first of all treat them for malaria, because if yes. you don't, <laughs> so they say go crazy with malaria. Iron deficiency, also known as sideropenia, is a common public health issue in dengue endemic countries. Interesting. Right. Could that mm-hmm. have been the stimulus for this whole study? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows don't how know. it began? Don't know. So, They said, uh, in mice, can we make mice uh, iron deficient? And what's this going to do to uh, dengue transmission? So they feed mice, this dengue model of mice, they feed them uh, an iron-free diet for five weeks. Iron-free diet. Good Lord. Okay? And they show that, in fact, the iron is down in these animals. Right. Then they infect them with dengue. They put mosquitoes on them. Uh, they put two different kinds of mosquitoes, two different strains of mosquitoes. Um, I think they're both field mosquitoes, right? And um, the the iron-free diet doesn't influence the viremia in the mouse, okay? That's important. Right. Yep. Just as much virus there. But um, 
the viral load and the prevalence in mosquitoes are enhanced by feeding on iron deficient mice. Hmm. So again, something's happening in the mosquito, and we already know what that is because sure. we just addressed the mechanism. Right. Uh, so you take away iron, you have um, better dengue uh, multiplication in mosquitoes and transmission. So then if you supplement these mice, now they're iron deficient. What happens if you give them iron back? Right. What happens? Um, and what happens is you reduce dengue prevalence right. in the mosquitoes when you give mice iron. So that would be an altruistic approach, right? Because you're going to give it to the people. They won't prevent them from acquiring dengue, but it will right. prevent them from yeah, giving it. From spreading. It will yeah, prevent them from exactly, spreading. Exactly. So now they go back to the human blood samples and they measure the iron concentrations and it ranges in these samples from 0.5 to 2.5 micrograms per mil. And they say, if we, the ones that, um, the blood samples that enhanced the mosquito acquisition of virus had low iron. And if you supplemented it, it fixes it. It brings back the transmission down again, dengue replication and transmission in the mosquitoes. So did they determine um, what the minimum level of viremia is in the mosquito that's necessary for transmission? No, they didn't. They just show it's reduced, right? Yeah. But it's never zero. No. Right? Right. But so even if they get a slow start in a human, well, that's a good question. How much do you? Ha how low do you have to go to prevent? Right. So in the mouse, you can reduce it substantially by. Yeah. I think the the. Um, well, iron, in the human blood samples, they had some that didn't zero transmit, zero that, that were yeah. zero that yeah. did not transmit uh -huh. to the mosquito at all at, at any detectable I, I, level. Okay, but 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 let's say you had five percent of the of the normal level of virus uh, transmitted to the mosquito is that enough though to initiate an infection from that well, mosquito into a human that's probably known and I would say that if it's very low it's going to you do that experiment because you do need a certain viremia to get efficient <laughs> yeah, transmission right because the mosquito right. can only take so many microliters yeah, yeah. exactly and so, so You're not much like virus. a reduvid bug <laughs> how much can they take a lot <laughs> they take mill milliliter quantities really yeah huge number. so the iron concentrations in human serum are from half to two and a half micrograms per mil and these right. blood samples that didn't that that transmitted uh, ended up allowing transmission well, had less than 0.55 micrograms per mil of uh, iron. Mm. So if you supplement that, you can inhibit uh, replication and transmission in the mosquito. Right. So that's the story here. And then, you know, the question is whether um, you should, they say, we propose that iron deficiency in dengue endemic areas may contribute to the permissiveness to dengue facilitating its spread. Therefore, iron supplementation might be good. However, they point out that it yeah. helps plasmodium infection, yes, right? right? Absolutely. So malaria, malaria. there have been a number of studies. Um, anemia is a widespread problem in the tropics yes. for a variety of reasons. There's malnutrition, there's uh, hookworm infection, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, so efforts that have tried to correct anemia have discovered that people show up in the hospital with worse symptoms of their malaria infections. Correct. Correct. And it seems that iron supplementation makes malaria worse. And so you don't want to just go around giving iron supplements to reduce dengue no. in areas where you also have endemic plasmodium because it could be out of the frying pan and into the fire. Well, the year they established the country of Bangladesh, the WHO realized that the, the single most um, serious problem health-wise that they could correct in a short period of time was anemia. Mm -hmm. And so they recommended iron supplements for everybody, and there were thousands of infant deaths from malaria. Mm -hmm. An unintended consequence. But so what's that, the solution? Yes. Well, the solution is you check for malaria <sighs> first, treat it, and then give iron supplements. And that oh, that would work. It is complicated, yeah. but uh, if you don't treat the malaria first, you're going to die. <laughs> so, how, what is what is involved in treating for malaria? How long a treatment? It's a couple of days to a week, and then you give three or four doses of a certain drug. In those days, the chloroquine resistance wasn't so bad, so you could give that to an infant that was born of a mother right. that had malaria. But and then you hope that they don't pick up malaria again. later. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Later. That's right. You're going to continue the iron supplementation yeah. indefinitely, right? Sure. 
You have right. to. Right. So, sure. so this has to be part of, and it, it's one of these things where you, you dip your toe in well, public right. health and you realize right. everything's connected to everything else. This is all true. Mm-hmm. Um, and with these, with these types of diseases that plague poor countries in particular, it's part of a whole scene. Sure. And if you don't control the malaria, which is going to be hard, That's then right. you're not going to be able to deal with the anemia effectively. Then you're right. It, yeah. So the the other thing that's wrong with anemia is that it it uh, upregulates an, uh, a metal ion transporter in the gut tract to help scavenge all the iron that's being released, mm-hmm. so that you don't excrete any iron. Okay, but you also, if you live in a, 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 an area of industrial pollution where there's a lot of heavy metal contamination, like lead, for instance, the lead will be absorbed the same way as the iron is. Right. So those kids will become uh, compromised with regards to their ability to learn. And that's the research that Peter Hotez is uh, mm-hmm. involved with. So you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you do. So there is a case where <laughs> this supplementation works, and that's oh, sure. vitamin A for blindness. Oh, but right? of course. Yes. That was that's perfect right. there with small amounts. Two, right. two cents worth of vitamin A will that's right. impact blindness. And it spina doesn't, bifida also. But it doesn't, even, it doesn't, it doesn't enhance other infections. That's no, the nice no. thing about that. But iron is a mixed bag, no. apparently. But they also say that some of these studies are of the effect of irons are a little bit compromised because they're not well controlled for certain factors. Maybe we need to do some really careful studies before we perhaps decide what's going on here. Yeah. But I think your idea of uh, testing for malaria and then you can treat treating. and then give iron that, that works. What's the and, and making it part of a comprehensive package of attempting to control, mal- pull- control right. malaria, because in treating the malaria, you're course, also preventing that person from spreading malaria. That's right. And mm-hmm. hopefully you would then send somebody to their house to evaluate the situation, install some window screens right. or insecticide-treated bed nets and uh, combat the <laughs> risk of subsequent infection and, you know. Right, so you could continue thing. the iron supplementation. Hey, all you need yes. is a stable government. <laughs> yes, that is kind of step zero, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> problem, isn't it? That's the biggest problem, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Biggest problem. So it turns out that iron is regulates other viral infections. Ah, and in mosquitoes the, or in humans? No, not all, but say, no, in uh, in mammalian cells. So, for example, oh, hepatitis C virus, oh. iron blocks replication because it binds to the RNA polymerase, which normally needs, it's probably a magnesium ion, huh. and iron goes in there and substitutes and it's no longer active. That's pretty interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. It's also influenza, HIV, Zika virus, and enterovirus 71 are inhibited by iron as well. Hmm. And other viruses too. I know from our discussions on TWIM that bacteria in the gut uh, want to get iron. There's always, Mm -hmm. there's this battle for iron between us and bacteria. You know, we have iron binding proteins and bacteria make ones that are better. So they steal the iron from the the ocean. Iron piracy. Iron piracy. In the ocean, (laughs) iron is the limiting factor for algal blooms. Dixon, you said this once and someone wrote in and said you were wrong. No, they didn't. You sure? (laughs) Yes. Because you said if you drag a thing of iron behind a ship, you'll get a bloom. And someone wrote in and said nonsense. That's nonsense. Is is it? No. Where do you, where, what's your source? I'll tell you what. No, 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 we'll take a break here. <laughs> no, it's okay. We can say it again, and they can write in. Again. No, I'm gonna go check that because I've actually seen the. the um, what do you, What do you drag behind the ship? You drag uh, um, uh, a mesh of iron. No, it's it's it's. It's it's an iron compound. It's a ferrosulfate or something. Yeah, I don't think it's just a nail. I think it's you, no, 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 no. Actually, it's iron. It's, it's you're it's, actually diffusing an iron compound correct. into the right. Iron fertilization of oceans is a thing. Thank you. Iron uh, stimulates blooms of toxin-producing algae Thank in the you. open ocean. Thank you. Now right. the person who wrote in that said I was crazy. They were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, oh, yeah, he that's you what you are. What drag, am I? You can't just drag a mesh of iron behind it. No, but the, what they were trying to do there was because there's a correlation between algal blooms and cloud formation. Believe it or not. How does iron, does iron run off from fertilizer? Yeah. From farms? Sure. That but, too? But yeah. mostly it's carried across the Atlantic Ocean by uh, Shirakos from the uh, Sahara Desert. Okay. It's in the it's in the sand. It's in the sand, and okay. it's in the dust. And when it falls into the ocean, it it triggers these plumes of toxic algae. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the deal. All right. Well, we'll put it out there. 
please. Maybe this was pretty recent that... Um, Maybe I get the same letter. <laughs> this person said that. Well, uh, they didn't check their... Um, you can see these... Um, Wikipedia. <laughs> you can see these blooms from... Yes, outer space, outer space correct, exactly. It's right. called iron fertilization. You and there, you can see the trail also, of the boat. You can see the trail of the boat right. behind there, it. There are, there are other fertilization um, mediated algal yeah. blooms, like right. the the um, the zone in the Gulf of Mexico that starts up every year when the runoff comes from the farms. And that's right. nitrogen. Right, that's right. That's right. So that's, um, you know, the, the algae still do need correct. iron, but correct. they're getting a huge influx of nitrogen that's causing an algal bloom. That organic to, nitrogen, that's right. That's oh, that's and right. organic matter, right. That's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, we do all kinds of interesting things with the world, don't we? <laughs> yeah, some good and some not so good, right? That's right. But this is really interesting that iron, if you're anemic, you may transmit dengue better. So maybe... Making you not anemic is good, but it could impact other infectious diseases in a well, bad way, right? Yeah, but yeah. In, in areas that have a dengue problem but not a malaria problem, huh. yeah, where's it's that? pretty straightforward that you should <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask Try you to, that. A, you look at the maps, and I don't think you're going to find too many Let's places like Let's dengue, that. but no malaria. Let's see. Global distribution. You're going to get very few places. Hmm. Maybe. But, Maybe some of the Caribbean yeah. islands, perhaps. Yeah, some, that's what I was thinking of. Although they probably don't have a, the same anemia problem that the places with endemic malaria have. No, so uh, diet. In where, those cases, it's diet. Where are these places with endemic anemia? Where are they? Africa? Uh, the, no, any all, rural all poor countries. countries poor, pretty it, much because have. they eat yeah. a lot of starches and they eat a lot of... Um, of um, Carbohydrates, but they don't need a lot of protein. And that's the problem because the protein, the protein has the iron. Reliable for exactly. Plus, they've got these infections that Alan mentioned. You know, like right. hookworm is a big problem in a lot of these in places. Twelve countries, fifty percent or more of women of reproductive age have anemia. Exactly. So that's that's addressing exactly. an issue that you brought up exactly. before. Where is anemia most common in the world? Right. Developing nations of Africa and Asia. Yeah. But well, that's where the blood suckers live. That's where the hookworms yeah. are. In the we we have some blood suckers here in the U.S. We do. There well, was yes, but <laughs> it's more metaphorical. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's our two papers for today. Let's that's great um, stuff. Great stuff. I think they're both very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, totally. Uh, did a little bit different, but really cool. Different is good. Actually, all, all virology is good, right? Uh, t- some email. Theodore writes, "Dear Twiv." My name is Theodore, and I am a grad student at Drexel University. I had a question about the current HIV-1 cure strategy used to cure the Berlin and London patients. Currently, it is possible to delete the CCR5 co-receptor in stem cells to prevent CCR-tropic HIV from infecting CD4-positive cells. However, to my knowledge, it is not possible to delete CXCR4 co-receptor without severely harming or killing the patient. Thus, <laughs> it's not practical to delete the gene. Does TWIV think the cure strategy of hematopoietic stem cell transplant used for the Berlin and London patients is capable of being used to cure patients infected with R4-tropic HIV? If so, how? Mm. What an interesting question. Yes, you can't, you can't knock out CXCR4 gene because CCR, it's essential. Right. Now, the London and the Berlin patients were cured of their infections by deleting CCR5. The, um, the, you get infected with R5 binding viruses. They mm-hmm. then, during reproduction, they diversify to R4. And that's the main, right? The main virus and, population in you is R4. And then you transmit only R5 viruses, right? Right. So, so there Brianne, needs to be a bottleneck for, for transmission of R5 unless right. you're being uh, infected through something like IV drug use. Then CXCR4 um, viruses can infect you. So how were Berlin and London patients uh, cured if they had mainly R4 viruses in them, which I assume they did, or maybe they didn't. Maybe they had most of them. Um, I haven't seen the sequence, um, so I don't uh, uh, actually know that. I think that with the the Berlin patient, it was really a question of we know that CCR5 mutations can protect against acquisition, so let's try it. Yeah. Um, and it clearly worked in that case. Um, you could imagine that when those patients got their um, 
radiation and bone marrow transplants, that that may have um, removed any XR4 uh, viruses mm. um, that or may have stopped that replication because they were less fit. And then the CCR5 using viruses were unable to replicate. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I looked a little bit about uh, CXCR4 deletions. Mm. Um, and apparently CXCR4 um, knockouts are embryonic lethal in mice. Um, but someone has found a mutant of C- CXCR4 that does not have a role in hematopoietic stem cell differentiation. And so there are a couple of papers with someone using a P191A mutation in CXCR4 mm. to potentially do this. Nevertheless, the German and the London patient were cured of presumably both the English patient. four and, <laughs> and, and five viruses, although we're not sure of the mechanism, right? For the R4, we're not sure. Mm. And if anyone exactly. knows, if anyone knows out there, and we have lots of listeners who work on HIV AIDS, let us know. It's a good question. Probably you have it on an exam, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Good question. <laughs> it is a good question. Uh, Brian, can you take the next one? Sure. John writes, Vincent, I first learned of your podcast through the now defunct Science 360 radio. S3R introduced me to all your podcasts and so many others. I'm a mechanical engineer, frustrated scientist, and so enjoy the scientific and technical banter. Uh, Didn't know if you heard that uh, S3R, Science 360 radio, was going silent. I'll surely continue to listen, though. Regards, John. I did not know this, and I went, and he, indeed, it shut down. It's too bad, because NSF used to run this website. Oh. Where they aggregated all the science podcasts they could find, yeah. and you could go to the website and play any one of them. They even had an app. I guess the app is dead, too, because the, the server is gone. Hmm. It's too bad. And I just wonder if it's, you know. Did they just of, run out of money? I don't know. It just says it's gone. If you go to the website, you know, science360.gov, it will say um, uh, it's it's uh, done. <laughs> so if you oh. go to science360.gov, it's, it brings you to the video part of it. And um, th- so that's because it defaults to a different URL. But if you actually go to science, how did I get here? Yeah, and it said podcasts is no longer working. Science 360 Radio, let me try. Yeah, here we go. Um, Science 360 Radio, so the URL is science360.gov slash radio, is no longer streaming. But f- please find our podcast list at science360 dot something, and if you go there, it says we are no longer streaming. So anyway, uh, shows, let's try that. Science360.gov slash radio dot shows. I guess there's still a list of um, podcasts, but you can't play them anymore. I think it's unfortunate because I think a lot of people found, as John did, science podcasts there. So it's too bad. I'm sorry, NSF, you had to do this. Yeah. How can we, um, everyone, write to NSF and tell them you want it back? <laughs> right. They may not. They, yeah, yes. they, they may, just, it may just be the grant ended and they don't have the money to do another one. I don't know. Too bad. Dixon you- or anybody at NSF who knows, please write in. Yeah, let, let us know. know. Right. Anthony, Anthony writes 2019 education award called expanded the universe. I lived in beyond homeschool and the mall gives a uh, website and uh, Lee Bardugo on ninth house, whatever that means. Someone must know that. What is that? Well, the link is to an NPR, you know, uh, right. So it's, it's mm-hmm. basically a, it's the author here. And that's a quote from an author interview. That's right. The author here writing. is talking about fantasy and science fiction. While in high school, I read a lot of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Robert Heinlein, and similar time wasters, like eating chocolate in the hope of acquiring trace minerals. Yeah, like, like you can iron. do that. You can do that. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad that everyone, particularly students, has access to your work as wings to escape like Daedalus. From the prison of a narrow world. Yeah, that's very nice. So he's referring to my education. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's yeah. saying that I uh, I provide wings. So th- you do. We, we do. We all provide wings. Excellent. It's very nice. Yes, that was a nice analogy. All right, Alan, we have one more. 
Sure. Ryan writes, this is as SB 276 is underway here in California and debates are underway in other states to see if they should do the same in 2020. And this is the California measure that would um, that would make it significantly harder to get an exemption for your child getting vaccinated to go to school. A mm-hmm. uh, quote from a news article, Sacramento, Californians strongly support a state law creating new oversight of vaccine medical exemptions for school children in a statewide poll released Monday with backing across a spectrum of political affiliations, income and education levels and geography. Uh, polls from UC Berkeley Institute of Governmental Studies conducted by, for Los Angeles Times, 90% of Democrats, 82% of those with no party preference, and 73% of Republicans supported um, increasing immunization rates by uh, by having the Department of Public Health review and possibly reject doctors' uh, excuses that a child can skip all or some of their shots. Uh, eight out of 10 voters said they supported the new law. 61% said they favored it strongly. Only 16% opposed it. Strongest dissent was from participants in the poll who described themselves as very politically conservative. One third of those said they opposed it. The Ted Bundys of the world. But, but <laughs> even, even then, 67% of conservative voters who participated overwhelmingly supported it. Right. So very strong support for cracking down on on this nonsense of getting your kids out of the vaccines they need. Well, it's oversight, right? Which is good because many yeah, physicians right. just will They're, give you people, a, a re- People will shop around for a doctor yeah. who will write them a, a note saying you, you don't have to vaccinate your child. And uh, yeah. uh, this is closing that loophole. And apparently there are a lot of them in Texas. Yeah. Where last year, like. Ginny Sue told us that up to some counties in Texas up to 50% exemptions, which is horrendous. Right? Wow. Very bad. All right, time for this, some. This letter, yes. This letter also told me that I've been thinking about my research uh, quite a lot lately because when I read about the Institute of Government Studies poll, I thought it was an ISG poll. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, sometimes these acronyms overlap, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's, it's uh, inevitable. We had one yesterday. Um, what was it? I can't remember, but it was one thing and another. Yeah, ISG poll. Let's do some picks. What do you have, Bran? Um, so some of you may have heard about um, a paper that came out about CCR5, um, as our uh, previous letter writer had mentioned, mm. um, that showed that CCR5 was um, associated with a shorter lifespan, um, and it made a lot of news. And the authors of that paper have recently um, sort of publicly talked about the fact that there uh, seemed to be some uh issues in the database that they used for um, the genomics. Um, And they've uh, decided to retract that study, but they've also been very, very public about the issues and their process and sort of, um, I I don't think I've ever seen someone be as open about potential issues in a study um, as I've seen here. I've been really, really impressed with um, the authors and their ability to say, um, we're having these issues. This is what we can't figure out and, and sort of talking through the process. Um, maybe it's because it's the first one of these types of things I've seen while looking at social media. Um, but I've just been really impressed with how the authors have sort of been almost giving an example of how you should do science yes. um, when you find a problem. Well, and I think a key point here is um, – a lot of the a lot of the time when you hear about a retraction, it's because somebody did something deliberately bad. Right. Exactly. Like faked data. This is does not appear to be that. This appears no, to be it, a glitch. It seems there's an error in their database, and they found that the error would could explain most of their results. Exactly. Um, so there's an so error this, in the database in terms of frequency. This is in the category of screw of ups. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So basically, and, the original. And so yeah, they're very. Very transparent about it, which is great. The original observation yeah, I, was that the this CCR five change could cause shorter lives, which would have been bad for the the babies that born in China. Right, and it could have China. been sort of the first time where we've seen a negative effect of that CCR five yeah, mutation. Yeah. Um, that everybody wants to do all of that, you know, yeah, stem yeah, cell yeah, yeah. therapy or whatever on, and so it could be important to know that there was a negative effect. Uh, of that mutation. Right. Um, and, uh, but we know that about 16% of the world's population carry a, a deletion right. of CCR5 gene. So probably it doesn't shorten lives, right? Because it wouldn't be maintained in the population. 
Perhaps well, not. You just okay. have to reproduce, and then after that, there's no selective pressure. Right. Although um, I, I think the way that the way that the study looked, it yeah. said that there was a difference in how many of them made it to seventy, as opposed to how many of them made it to forty. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, we were fine as a species living to forty-five and then dying. We're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just been so impressed by their transparency um, and the yeah. way that they've handled this whole thing. Mm. You know, we should have mentioned the, the Nobel Prizes in medicine. That's true. It's pretty oh, right. cool Shut stuff. Yes. yes. Because it's kind of a little bit related to our blood iron, right? <laughs> How cells yeah. sense and adapt to oxygen levels. Right. Um, right. So this is HIF1, HIF. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's mm -hmm. fantastic um, stuff. So this is... Um, Two Americans and one British, Bill Kalin of Dana-Farber and Harvard, Sir Peter Ratcliffe of Oxford and uh, um, and uh, the Francis Crick Institute, and Greg Semenza of Johns Hopkins. Nice. They will share the prize of uh, 900,000 kroner. Right. Which is about $900,000. Is it a kroner a buck? No, it's a little more than that, actually. In uh, dollars, it's, a, it's... Nine million Swedish kroner or $900,000. Right. 300K each. It's going to be gone in a minute. <laughs> taxes. <laughs> taxes. Tax will take half of it. Forget but it. of course, it's the honor. And then taking out your friends to dinner. So I'm looking at a stat um, article on this from October 7th. And the prizes are being announced in um, by Thomas Perlman, who's secretary of the Nobel Committee. And this is happening on the campus of Karolinska in the, in this this little house that I went and saw, which is where the Nobel Prizes are. I have a picture of myself in front of it. I looked in the window because it's closed. And he said, yes, in October there, they will announce. And there it is. That's right. And they say they have all these press here. And all they want to know is how the finding will affect people. That's all I can That's true. <laughs> which it's true. is reasonable, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The NPR had a story the other night about the woman from Austria who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And uh, she heard about it by driving along a road in Austria. Mm. <laughs> and she pulled over to the side of the road. She couldn't believe it. Neither could anybody else in her car, by the way. <laughs> well, I do remember years ago, an economist here at Columbia won the Nobel Prize. The next day he was driving he and he died. That's right. They found him dead oh, in the wow. car on the side of the That's road. He had true. a heart attack or a stroke right. or something. That's right. That's right. That's right. I guess he was excited. Yes. As you should be. Yeah, I guess, yeah. You know, David Baltimore He got a said, poor return on that prize. Yeah. He did. David Baltimore yeah. said the problem with getting a Nobel Prize early in life is that you never get any other prizes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, what else do you need? Exactly. Uh, Your lecture fee it far exceeds any prize that you could possibly want. After you get the Nobel Prize. How did you feel, Dixon, after your prize? I was astounded that they chose such an idiot. <laughs> Which prize were we talking about here? Was it? The one that fell out of that box, that snack box. <laughs> I, I have, so t tell me your honest, if you're in the presence of a Nobel laureate, do you feel a little different than a, any other Depends scientist? on the person. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. For instance, with Bill Campbell, no. Because he's a real person and he didn't let it go to his head. He was a realist also. He, he actually he said, economically speaking, I didn't gain much by it. <laughs> but I, He but shared he, it with two other people. Yeah. I know he did. Yeah. But the point of that was that he was validated for a life's work that he did at Mark. Yeah. And I think that was great. And Marty Chalfie is a very humble guy also. I like him a lot. And you don't feel like you're being towered over by somebody. I whenever I'm, I see Richard Axel or Eric Kandel, <laughs> I just think, holy crap. A Nobel laureate. Yeah, it's right. just so rarefied that it is. that's just that alone. It's true. Right? No, you're right. You're right. I was lucky. I went to Rockefeller for three years, and there were lots of Nobel prizes all over the yeah, place. They had so you, a lot there. You got yeah. used to it, and you, we couldn't actually get used to it. But at least you, you accepted them as real people rather than icons. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, I have a pick that's actually um, a plug for something a friend of mine does. Um, they just found out I. I play cards with this uh, with this woman about every week <laughs> um i found out uh, they're a they're a Cute. an illustrator a cartoonist very gifted cartoonist who works on cartoon books about science so my main pick is nomad press which is this wow. um this thing that i never would have heard about before but they do um uh books about science various science topics mainly for the elementary school crowd and you can get cartoon books about uh, 
you know, physics and chemistry and geology and natural disasters and you know, various ancient civilizations. And it's all, uh, it's all illustrated and well explained and just at, at the level that, um, kids in elementary school will be able to appreciate. Uh, and the sub pick for this is the person who pointed me to it at Lex Cornell. Um, and I would recommend if you're looking for a cartoonist for a project, maybe you're going to do a comic book on vaccines or something. Um, drop, drop Lex a line because a uh, very, very talented and capable person who's done this kind of work. Great. Gutsy girls. And the website for, for Nomad Press also has some videos on it that are cool and they do a bunch of other um, educational stuff that's cool. a lot of fun. It's amazing. I want to read about crazy contraptions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. How about Gutsy Girls series? Gutsy yeah. Girls go for, go for science paleontologists. Right? Cool. Cool. Isn't that the title of Hillary and uh, Chelsea's new book? I don't know. Is it? Is yeah. It? Gutsy Women. I think it's called Gutsy Women. Okay. Gutsy Women. Uh, yeah, the book of Gutsy Women by Hil- Hillary and Chelsea. Right. Favorite stories of courage and resilience. Exactly. Yeah, October 2019. It just came out. No, cool. I just saw them interviewed on NPR. So that's probably yeah. how I knew that. That's cool. Yes. Yeah, mother and daughter. How about yep. that? She went to Chelsea. Went here for her MPH. That's right. That's right. She never took any of my courses. <laughs> she <laughs> took one of mine. Which one? I uh, well, I was the acting chairman of epidemiology then. So. But I once had a daughter of a U.S. senator. That's nice. That's good. Uh, but I taught actually in a uh, uh, what's the school across the street. <laughs> When you were in for a while, epidemiology. Yeah, the school. <laughs> I, taught her, I taught there on Monday, and uh, she didn't take that course. No. All right, so who's next here? Dixon, what do you have? Well, I'm up late last night, as usual, just trying to find a nature show to sort of calm my nerves. You were nervous? I hate what's going on in the government right yeah. now. I'm just, oh, that, just absolutely yeah. disturbed beyond belief. And so, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are other things going on, too, but... But I ran across this show. It was on one of the channels with four numbers. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know, you're way up in the stratosphere of the channel selector when you got that, right? And it's called Rare, colon, Creatures of the Photo Arc. Oh, the monkey's so cute. And this, this episode <laughs> was about three different animals. One was about the southern Chinese tiger, which I didn't even know existed. And it barely does, by the way. Another one was on the largest freshwater turtle soft shell turtle it also lives in china and um they were there's three turtles left as far as they know there are only three two are males and one is a female and she lays a clutch of eggs every year whether she's fertilized or not and they they can't get them to reproduce in their little habitat so they were trying artificial insemination <laughs> of a turtle it had never been tried before and of course how would you do that because turtles are not usually that big this thing was as big as this table vincent it was huge it, was, it weighed up 150 pounds for this turtle right and then he was looking for the cross river gorilla the subspecies of cross river gorilla i never even knew that was existing right and the cameroons and i, and I thought of beatrice Hahn and all the stories that we were telling about bush meat and that sort of thing and then and they were looking in the markets for whether or not there were these gorillas there no they weren't there he had to go to a zoo or, 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 or not a, a wildlife refuge to uh, get a picture of one of these gorillas you should see his photographs though he takes a black background and he puts the animal in front of the black background and mm-hmm. all you see is the animal you don't see anything else and there yeah, ast- these pictures are great they are astounding pictures and this guy is so humble you you watch this show and his, he barely he pretends he barely knows what he's doing and he was dragged up up and down the mountain ranges of Cameroons looking for these gorillas. They never actually saw the gorillas, but that that when I mentioned before on the show here that uh, they sampled the scat, and from the DNA right. profiles they could tell that there were twenty five gorillas in this troop. They put them on a black background. They do. they do. How do they do that? They bring it out in the field with them? No, no. He mostly are zoo pictures. Most of the pictures oh. that he's got are zoo pictures. Yeah. And But you only concentrate on the animal then. Nothing else interferes with yeah, what you're looking cool. at. And they're very, cool. very expressive. I know. I'm looking. The ones with eyes in particular. <laughs> Absolutely. So cool. Yeah. This kiwi is great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's so. And they have some behind the scenes where they're. 
in the in the field and yes. they're holding yes that's right kiwi. that's right so that's right the monkey is amazing yes oh my gosh yeah i think these are, i like these the are leopard neat. they're fabulous Leopard's cool too the they're way fabulous. he or she blinks right and, and there's a book yep. on this now and i bought it for my grandson because he's just about to turn four in november and i'm going to sit there with him and we're just going to page through this and he's just going to be astounded animals by the, are amazing the, and life on earth is amazing wish we didn't no, mess it up no question about it I mean, these, these animals are so incredible i totally right? agree with you the living things the animals is restrictive right yeah 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 cool very nice so this was at 3 a.m 3 a.m <laughs> that's right best thing that ever happened to me at 3 a.m <laughs> so once you found it did you fall asleep no i was riveted i was absolutely <laughs> stunned right. by what he had to go through my pick is a book called <clears throat> The Odyssey of Eradication, actually Polio, The Odyssey of Eradication. I have it right here, Dixon, you see it? I do. It is by um, Thomas Abraham, who sent it to me, Uh and he is a journalist. Right. uh, And on the back is a quote by Chelsea Clinton. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. Abraham's masterful telling of the now 30-year effort to eradicate polio is a story of grand ambition, local politics, global health governance, health literacy, the universal instinct of parents to protect our children, and much more. A must-read. Yeah. It's a very good. It's a nice history of the eradication right. effort, um, what went into it, what's going on, what's why it's really hard. And Vincent is mentioned five times in the book. Well, that's not why I'm thinking it. <laughs> Whoa. Of course not. But I, but, I should be mentioned still. ten. I should be mentioned ten. <laughs> It's okay. I'll take five. Um, yeah, he quotes me a few times, which makes me think I must have spoken to him at some point. I, I, I'm sure I did, but it's really good. And, you know, it starts out, uh, you know, in a little town in um, Pakistan where the, he's he's going along with the immunizers who are sure. going house to house sure. with armed guards because sure. you have right. to be immunized. You don't have a choice. And he's like, you know, exactly. you, you can't do this in the U.S. No. But- um, these people are mostly like polio. We have other issues, and why yeah. do we need to get a polio vaccine? But right. uh, this is what they're doing, and you you recognize how difficult it is, and yeah. some of the science behind this, and it's really good. It's really right. really well done. So um, you should check it out. Vincent Racaniello, a professor of virology. I'm not a professor of virology. But sure. Well, <laughs> he he quotes me about recalled disputes with Sabin over the merits of genetic engineer sequencing. He thought that any vaccine associated polio virus was really wild virus. He really didn't understand that the sequence tells you that it was a Sabin derived virus. He was a very smart man. The only thing you can say is some hubris got in the way. <laughs> so I said that apparently. Very cool. Anyway, yes, uh, not because I'm quoted in it, but it's a good book. It's the only one I know of, of the history of uh, the er- Odyssey of Eradication. Yeah. Gee. Excellent. I'm glad somebody did that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. two, we have two listener picks. One is from Justin, not related to this project but I at all, but I absolutely love Mass Spec, and this blows my mind. This is a YouTube video about... Uh, the mass spec pen for accurate cancer detection during surgery. Oh. Uh, so a major challenge for cancer surgeons is to determine exactly where a tumor starts and when it ends, you know. The mass mm-hmm. spec pen, a handheld device in development, could someday enable surgeons to distinguish between mm. cancerous and healthy tissue in seconds in the operating room. So this is a video about that. It's a, It's um. Looks like it's a little panel discussion where they're talking about it. Okay. This is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, tech is going to get better and better. It's a matter of whether humans are around to utilize it, right? right. We, you know, destroy ourselves. Right. I'm amazed at what we can do. Yeah. On the one hand, science and technology is amazing, right? And on the other hand, people can be really bad. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> it's amazing, right? And yep. from Mark, hello, Twiv Pro Vaxxers. I will proudly accept that moniker. Sure. Weather here in, in California has cloudy mornings, sunny and warm afternoons, a.k.a. fall season boring. <laughs> Just another <laughs> shitty day in Paris, <laughs> paradise. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Of course, if they don't turn off your electricity, right? Right. Yeah. First, tonight I received my vaccination for 2019 flu. Have any of you? Yes. 
You yes. did. Where did you get yours, Alan? At the doc? Uh, the town town uh, flu clinic, and Laura got hers, I believe, at work, and Sophie got hers at the pediatrician's office. And Brian, you got yours at school. I got mine at Walgreens. Right. Six fifty. Cool. Uh, no, I just show Re- them my insurance card, and it's free. Did you get one, Dixon? Do, you and I have to go. Okay? We do. We we'll do. get one here. We usually yeah, sure. go in November. We do. Someone we go as a team. Us. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we will go in and get it. Okay. We will. Second, Vincent, I need to correct a grievous error you made in TWIV 566. Oh, oh, dear. You said the Ford Mustang came out in 1962. No, no, no. <laughs> it was launched in 1964. Lee Iacocca, Ford's marketing manager for the launch, coined the famous $64.64 slogan to entice buyers to finance the car at then affordable monthly payments. Wait a minute. He's, this is a Ford Mustang? Yes. Lee Iacocca? Yeah, he started it. I that thought was he was car. a Chrysler. He went later to Chrysler. Oh, its okay. success launched his career and burned the Mustang into our culture. Interesting. Yeah, I think he was first at Ford and the Mustang made him. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Third, a follow up question. You were all you all were discussing mutation in DNA viruses. That was our Rutgers. Mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. What is mm-hmm. what is oh, their right. error rate? In many prior shows, it's been mentioned that RNA viruses have a rate of 10 to the minus 4. What is it for DNA viruses? Well, I have a lovely figure here from Principles of Virology. <laughs> um, nice. So it, it graphs the mutation rate in um, substitutions per nucleotide per generation. So it's very specific. Mm. Versus genome size. And it's got all the different kinds of genomes here. So you can see bacteria are at like 10 to the minus 10th. That's, again, mutations per nucleotide per generation. Mm. So really low. Very. I would guess that our our genomes are probably a similar number. Uh, And then we have double-stranded DNA viruses. And some of those are about 10 to the minus 7th. 10 to the minus 6th, right? Now, single-stranded DNA virus is a slightly higher mutation rate, but, you know, about a log, a half a log, and we, we were talking about that at Rutgers, why that would be the case, and Siobhan Duffy works on that. Yeah, Siobhan has some great information on that. And then we have the RNA viruses, uh, which can be as low as 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 even, right? So there you go. Those are the numbers, right? Is that a good answer? Four. That's I a good answer. That, that's Four. the best answer you could. My give. listener pick of the week is this story from the New York Times. It's really first-rate investigative journalism, digging into the many issues: pilot training, Boeing's development culture, hmm. government inspection, unexpected consequences, and more surrounding the Boeing seven thirty-seven Max plane crashes. Cool. Mm. Yeah. Did what really brought down the seven thirty seven Max? We ever going to see that plane, Alan? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it to me, it seems like this is a fixable problem. It's going to be a question of uh, it's it's a whole political public relations issue, and, yeah. um, and just a. Uh, the FAA and and everybody need to look closely at their regulatory mechanism and did they cut Boeing too much slack on this and Boeing needs to make sure that they're going to remain a going concern and yeah they just lost a big contract to China oh they've they've had they've taken a huge hit from this whole thing yep they're dreamliner so they it's they made mistakes they shouldn't yeah. have uh, sacrificed you know making exactly. a lot of money for safety it's ridiculous well, right. I don't think they did well, that. Well, I don't think it was exactly that. I think it was, I think it's that if you look at Boeing's um, product history, I mean, this is a company that has built some of the safest conveyances in human history. Correct. Their their record is, has been um, just impeccable. And I think a certain amount of that may have gotten to their heads managerially and they said, well, you know, we're fine. We're Boeing. We're, this won't be a problem. And, and they and they were pushing the 737 to a point where they needed to expand the size of it, but they were still building on this platform that's now decades old. And they, they had some engineering issues with that and they figured they could fix it with software and, um, things just added up. Right. Mm. 
Well, so there were mistakes but a, made. A big, a big component of it was it's that training. they didn't properly train right. pilots right. on this and inform them of how this darn thing was working right. so that right. they would know how to disable it. And that's a really critical piece of it. And and yet there were so many flights with this before this these of course. things happened. So of course. a lot and, of pilots lot were going to do this. <laughs> a lot of air. Well, first of all, it doesn't malfunction very often. Right. Um, but secondly, a lot of um, airline pilots and uh, who have have commented that this is it would present itself as a problem called runaway trim. Uh, and the solution for that is to disable the trim system, which is a big circuit breaker right in front of both pilots, um, which would turn off this system. Hmm. So it, the Boeing's reasoning was, well, this will, if, if it goes wrong, it'll look like runaway trim. People will react appropriately, but it, that's not true. If you haven't explained to them what the system does. Right. Right. Hmm. So that's, yeah. It's unfortunate. It was. I don't you know. In the end, it's all about money. It's really sad. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. I know you're not. I understand you. It's not all, but really, money drives everything. And I think it's unfortunate because it's contaminating and really bad. I, I predict they're going to change the name of this airplane. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you when I go flying, I'm amazed that so many flights nothing happens right? Me too. it works of course yeah. Every- planes come in from europe right. they sit there for two hours and they go back to europe not only it's amazing that, day in and then out and the, out. the pilots <laughs> are from all kinds of countries they don't speak the native language of english but that's the, the conning tower only speaks english as far as i mm. have led to believe in, uh, and they, yeah they, so english is a mandatory language of aviation in other countries the the controllers will often speak the local language and most of the pilots will right but they still speak English. That's right. Mm. Exactly right. Makes sense. Finally, from Mark, continuing fifth, my listener anti-pick of the week. <laughs> and some, this is fantastic. <laughs> some banter. You all talked and joked about boring people. Self-defenestrated James Watson <laughs> <laughs> wrote a book entitled Avoid Boring People, which shows him at his supercilious best. And uh, he gives an Amazon link and a YouTube interview about the book. Self-defenestrated James I, I plan to use self-defenestrated I pretty often beautiful. now. Yes. Yeah, this... Uh, I saw a book on a shelf in Chris Sullivan's office in Austin. I think this might have been it. It was by James Watson. I think it was Avoid Boring People. And I, I was looking through the Photographs, he has a lot of photographs in it, and Dixon will appreciate this. There was a 1968 picture of Max Gottesman oh, wow. with Wally Gilbert. Oh, my goodness. He's very young looking in the oh picture. Right. Isn't that funny? Right, right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Justin. And that is TWIV569, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. Your money, your cash, microbe.tv slash contribute. That sounds crass, but we'd love to have your support. <laughs> it's all about money. Just I said. was just going to say that. I was just <laughs> well, I, I actually, uh, it's not about money because we don't bring in hardly anything at all. <laughs> and I, Very little money is brought, only enough to pay for our expenses. And um, if you'd like to help us out with that, it um, would be great. A few, a few hundred of you do, and we appreciate that, but uh, we could use a few hundred more. Um, yeah, money. You need money to do things. I understand, but you know, you don't need huge quantities of money. We don't need to get wealthy. Uh, so. And if you'd like to donate a Boeing seven thirty seven Max to us, <laughs> well, well. <laughs> oh, I would sell it. Although I probably yeah, would salvage exactly. the parts. We, we, we couldn't buy fuel for it. <laughs> I would sell it for parts. Yes, sure. and um, parts. Exactly. use the money for. If I ever encountered a large sum of money, I would put it into Micro TV to uh, further the. I mean, I want, as I said in in Austin last year, I want to make something that will endure. I'm afraid right now, if not I disappear like, tomorrow, the whole thing goes down the not drain. Not like the science podcast for NSF. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Micro TV slash contribute Dixon de Palmier can be found at trichinella.org and parasites without borders.com, the living river.org. Dot com or dot org? I think it's dot com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Nice to see you. Haven't seen you in months. 
<laughs> I saw you last week, right? I did, actually. <laughs> Are you going fishing this week? I am. I'm going to go fishing Sunday. Pennsylvania. It's supposed to be nice. No, I'm going to go to the Catskills, I think. There's more water. There. There's more water? There's more water. Yeah, there, you need that for fish. Yeah, okay. It, it's yeah. a requirement. Enjoy. <laughs> Brian Barker's over at Drew University. Of, over on Twitter, she is Bioprof Barker. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. How's teaching well, going? Teaching is going very well. Good. Um, I'm getting uh, a big set of papers turned in on Monday, so this is my last no grading weekend for a little bit. Ugh. Well, it's October, and I have to. I had to register my course for next semester because the oh. registration opens November 27th. Interesting. Yes. And yes, that, we've had to do that as well. That's my tenth year of teaching virology. Wow. Mm. Cool. Looking forward to it. Going to make some changes this year. A lot of, oh. a lot of new information. I love it. <laughs> Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. On Twitter, he is Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his music. This episode was recorded, edited, and posted by me. <laughs> Emmy <laughs> Vincent Racaniello you've been listening to This Week in Virology thanks for joining us we'll be back next week another TWIV is viral <laughs>